അതിന് ശേഷം നമ്മുടെ നന്ദി പറയുക കോസ്റ്റ് വൺ ഡയറക്ടർ ചന്ദ്രബാബു നന്ദി പറയും ഇതാണ് പരിപാടി ഇതിൻ്റെ കാര്യങ്ങൾ നിയന്ത്രിക്കുന്നതിനായിട്ട് വിജയാനന്ദ് സാറിനെ ക്ഷണിക്കുകയാണ് we'll have uh, dr joy to give the welcome speech i'll briefly introduce you and then after your speech maybe some time for discussion any questions and then the director yeah, cosford will uh, give the uh, remarks i request uh, dr joy uh, to give the good evening to all welcome to this dr kn raj memorial lecture 2022 uh, for us from kila this is a very happy occasion to be with chh manon study and research center and the course board for organizing this memorial lecture i do not want to take too much time on explaining to you the background and uh, other aspects of the program as well as about the dignitaries who are present here let me straight away move into the task given to me uh, this is basically to welcome all of you especially dr mihir shah i don't think i have to introduce him to the audience like this but still there would be newcomers here and uh, dr mirsha on the one side for me he is an ex cds or a cds alumnus but uh, more than that he has grown from there to become one of the india's leading scholars not just a scholar but an activist um uh, and and, uh, and also in the policy making sector and his experiences it's not uh, he, he has been doing things at the grassroots level that is how he is known when he was with the planning commission and he was with the ministries and especially the rural development ministry and the budget ministry the water resources and other things and uh, he was instrumental in uh, the new water uh, national water policy uh a great part of his life has been his work with the tribal communities living with them in the remote parts of india and uh, from those experiences he has moved into the policy sector but that from the academics to the field to the policy is the way it has it also has to be done so uh, dr mirsha welcome dr mirsha to this uh, dr kn raj memorial lecture 2022 we have with us sri sm vijayanand uh, again uh, he is a former chief secretary of kerala and uh, former secretary of the ministry of panchayat raj and rural development but more than that he has been one of the art- architects of the people's plan campaign in kerala and taking it to the entire country uh, welcome so Dr. Vijayan, uh, Mr. Vijayan will be the uh, chair, chair for the lecture, today's lecture. Uh, welcome, sir, to this webinar or memorial lecture. And then we have uh, Mr. Chandra Babu, who is the director of the course for, uh, uh, who is also the organizer. So welcome, Mr. Chandra Babu, to this gathering. And we have uh, Many others who have assembled here. I can see many of those names like Professor Michael Tarajan and many others. I don't want to mention each name. Uh, welcome all the dignitaries to this memorial lecture. And uh, there are also youngsters joining from various parts of the academic in, from the academic institutions. Welcome all of you to this memorial lecture. Uh, once again, welcome all of you and thank you. Over to the chair uh, see the dance thank you dr joy i will make a brief introduction of uh, dr megisha as dr joy mentioned he doesn't need any introduction to such a uh, an audience we all know that he founded the samaj pragati sahyog which essentially means uh, 
facilitating community progress and they have made huge contributions particularly in the rain fed areas of central india he spent seven years in cds which he always remembers as a, a remarkable period and he's a great admirer of kerala's development and development strategies i have interacted very closely with him uh, since uh, 2009 when he took over as member and particularly since 2012 when we worked in delhi and now post retirement the association is even uh, closer and uh, it is a very it has been a very constructive creative kind of partnership i have had with dr shah when he was in the planning commission he supported the ministry very well and he was he chaired the committee on mg and rgs which brought about fundamental changes most of which were accepted by government and some of them some of them not most of them found place in the amendment to the schedule to the act then right from ideation of an organization called bharat rural livelihood foundation very innovative kind of organization which will be work on it, working on a corpus given by government but attracting funds and working with state government and ngos so a remarkable model it has been successful far beyond expectations so he from ideation till it took about 2 years for it to get institutionalized he was part of it and now he heads the national coalition for natural farming i know he is a bit unhappy with the tardy progress in kerala but he is doing remarkable advocacy work for natural farming in the larger interests of water conservation and broader ecology i had a sneak pre preview of the paper and it is a tribute from a diligent student to a great teacher and a really worthy memorial in that sense the quality of the paper makes it a memorial which will be remembered for a long time and dr raj would have been thrilled to see such a paper which is a constructive critique of kerala uh, the model within courts so please stay on listen to the full lecture every word and it will take about 50 minutes i guess and it promises to be a landmark paper uh, in kerala's development literature thank you very much i request uh, dr meher shah to take over thank you so much uh, mr vijayanand for these very kind words of introduction are you able to hear my voice clearly yes yes yeah okay so i'm extremely grateful to the achyuta menon study and research center post ford and kila for inviting me to deliver this lecture commemorating two truly great sons of kerala i would especially like to thank my very dear friend sn vijayanand who is one of the most remarkable human beings i have been fortunate enough to know over so many years and who has also helped shape the ideas i am about to present before you today for me it is always a pleasure to share reflections on and with comrades from kerala where i spent seven of the happiest years of my life at the center for development studies in the late 1970s and early 1980s for me kerala remains god's own country and anything i can possibly do to contribute to the well-being of its people is an absolute privilege i draw the title of my lecture from a pamphlet achyuta menon wrote in 1956 which also became the fulcrum of the manifesto of the communist party of india in the 1957 elections the pamphlet was titled towards a more prosperous and plentiful kerala in the light of the general accusation against the left of povertyism i find it remarkable that as early as the 1950s achyuta menon was already speaking in terms of prosperity and plentifulness both k n raj and achyuta menon were key contributors to the formulation of what has come to be known the world over as the kerala model of development after being celebrated for many years the kerala model has increasingly come under doubt question and attack this is not something i necessarily lament because it is undoubtedly true that all success stories invariably have an underbelly and it is the task of commentators and critics to draw attention to deficiencies which can then hopefully be corrected in the years to come of course there is a cautionary tale here as well 
within each line of questioning lies the inherent danger that it may go overboard in its critical energy, thereby at times throwing the baby out with the bath water, so to speak. This is very true of development economics in general, where fashions come and go, and the past is often treated with undeserved disdain. The most spectacular example is the ongoing dethroning of Nehru, overly revered once upon a time, and now castigated as if he is the source of all of India's troubles. Especially since the economic reforms of the 1990s, there has been a trend to belittle the contributions of Nehru. Among the many things forgotten in that critique is the vital role played by a strong public sector in the consolidation of a capitalist class in India, whose entrepreneurial energy was crucial to the successes achieved by India's economic reforms. As two of the most creative economists of our time, Mariana Matsukato and Carlota Perez have shown, this has been the case throughout the long history of capitalism. The debate around the Kerala model has similarly remained stuck within the binary of growth on the one hand and human development come distribution on the other. What has been completely overlooked in the discussion is that each growth pathway is characterized by unique consequences for social, ecological and financial sustainability as well as its degree of inclusiveness. Coming out of the binary, that imprisons the current debate could enable us to articulate a very different development trajectory, which learns the right lessons from history and leverages the unique social and ecological characteristics of Kerala. We could then hope to move towards the prosperous and plentiful Kerala that Achyuta Menon and K. N. Raj dreamt of. To understand why growth by itself is not enough, let us recall how even as India became one of the fastest growing economies in the world in the 21st century, unemployment emerged as a very serious concern that could by itself end up making the growth process unsustainable due to the unrest of India's youth, once seen as a demographic dividend, but increasingly the most disaffected section of society. Kerala has been no exception in this regard, with especially high rates of unemployment among women. To take another example, India's high rates of growth in agriculture following the Green Revolution have come at a very serious social, economic and ecological cost. While output has grown, farm incomes have not risen in tandem, even as costs of production of a fossil fuel based farm system have skyrocketed. This input intensive high cost agriculture has also been extremely water intensive, leading to a major crisis of falling water tables and groundwater quality. It has often resulted in negative farm incomes, forcing small and marginal farmers to work as laborers under the MGNREGA. But in some cases, the consequences have been even more catastrophic. In central India, many tribal farmers have joined the ranks of the Maoist insurgency. And all over the country, an estimated three and a half lakh farmers have committed suicide over the past 30 years something completely unprecedented in Indian history. Thus, it would be clear to you that what matters is not just rates of growth, but the benefits this growth confers on the large mass of people, the impact it has on our precious natural resources and how sustainable this growth proves to be over time. We must also recognize that the growth path followed in each context must reflect the larger ecosystem within which that economy and society are embedded. This is most especially true of Kerala, which is blessed with an ecology that is both extremely fragile and vulnerable, but also one which provides huge opportunities for economic growth and social development if appropriately leveraged. Hence, the central proposition I'm putting forward before you today is that while the Kerala economy must grow, it must grow on a path that leverages the strengths of his ecosystem, both natural and social, in a way that engenders growth that is widely inclusive and inherently sustainable. I suggest that this is not only eminently possible, but is an absolute imperative for the well-being of the people of Kerala. 
I'm not going to bore you today with another exegesis on the Kerala model. Rather, I will focus on the new direction Kerala needs to take, responding to the fresh challenges of the 21st century. I will explain why this change is required and also present examples from across the globe, India and Kerala itself, that illustrate the kind of approach and specific work the new model needs to embody. In order to do so, we must first carefully consider some unique features of Kerala. One, Kerala is a state with an extraordinary bounty of natural resources, which are both a source of vulnerability and strength. It has also been the site of some of the most innovative environmental movements in the world. Two, the state is characterized by high density of population and a unique rural urban continuum, which means that even its urban areas are interwoven with trees, lakes, backwaters, hills, and forests. This is the blue-green infrastructure whose preservation and rejuvenation must form a cornerstone of the Kerala model of development in the 21st century. Otherwise, these same features will continue to make Kerala much more vulnerable to natural disasters. Third, Kerala has developed a strong system of grassroots democracy, which needs to be given fresh direction and energy and dovetailed into the new development paradigm. Fourth, Kerala has built Kudumbashri, which is perhaps the largest and most effective program of women's empowerment in the whole world, covering around 45 lakh women and uniquely dovetailed with the Panchayati Raj system. This must become the fulcrum animating the new model of development, both so that women benefit, but also in order to redress the prevailing masculinities of the de development paradigm. And finally, Kerala enjoys a huge demographic dividend, its educated youth who can be its greatest strength, but also are its biggest challenge. Without mincing words, let me state upfront that in my assessment, the key weakness of the Kerala model of development is the absence of a central focus on ecology. What has been conspicuously missing in the Kerala model is the integration of ecology. This is truly ironic for a state famous for the Silent Valley movement and the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad. I'm not making a narrowly environmentalist argument here. To the contrary, I'm pointing to the strong economic case for focusing on ecological rejuvenation with positive implications for higher growth rates and job creation. So my argument is not the one that harks back to the binary of environment versus development. Rather, it builds on the proposition my colleagues and I first presented in our 1998 book, India's Drylands, where we showed how both employment guarantee and food security could be founded on ecological rejuvenation through watershed development. For ecology works both ways, as a constraint on growth and also as a way in which growth can leverage ecology. So ecology creates both trade-offs and win-wins. While during the early ecology movement, the focus was more on trade-offs, today the emphasis is on creating win-wins through nature-based solutions. A state like Kerala with its enviable ecological riches is ideally positioned to create multiple win-wins in this direction. The starkest illustration of how Kerala has ignored ecology is the extraordinary paradox that a state which receives more than 3000 millimeters of annual rainfall faces a serious water crisis today. To understand why this has happened, we need to make a deeper dive into the amazing diversity within Kerala's unique ecology. Kerala is divided into a large number of physiographic zones and agroecological regions according to their altitude, soil type, rainfall, and topography. 48% of the area of the state falls under highlands, 42% under midlands, and 10% under lowlands. 
there are as many as 10 hydrogeological settings in Kerala with nearly 7 million wells, bore wells, and tube wells. All combined, we get the most ecologically diverse state in India over a relatively small land mass. But the one-size-fits-all water strategies adopted in Kerala, like in the rest of India, do not reflect this diversity and have consequentially resulted in a man-made crisis of water. Water policy has ignored the key fact that 88% of the state is occupied by crystalline rocks with very low rates of natural recharge. These aquifers are generally thin or spatially limited and both their recharge capacity and water holding capacity are highly restricted. As a result, when we subject them to indiscriminate pumping, the result is falling water tables and poor water quality. Kerala ranks third only after Tamil Nadu and Punjab in terms of decline in groundwater levels in India. Kerala also has the highest levels of chemical and bacterial contamination of drinking water among all Indian states. If we want to solve Kerala's water problem, we will need to understand the nature of water as a common pool resource, a CPR, with profound interconnections among all elements of the water cycle. If we continue with the current pattern of atomistic and competitive drilling for water, the crisis will only get deeper. CPRs are shared resources and demand very different, deeply participatory, collective methods of governance and management. That this can be done has been amply demonstrated by millions of farmers in different parts of India who have come together to manage their shared resource, fully informed of the nature of their aquifers. Kerala needs to urgently learn from these examples. We must also realize the significance of preserving, indeed rejuvenating the health of our catchment areas, which is where we get all our water from. When we encroach upon, damage, block, or pollute the channels through which water flows into rivers, river flows suffer in quantity and quality. The natural morphology of rivers has taken hundreds of thousands of years to develop. Large structural changes to river channels can lead to unforeseen and dangerous hydrological, social, and ecological consequences. We also need to factor in the inextricable link between groundwater and surface water as each feeds into the other. When we overextract groundwater, rivers tend to dry up because of a decline in base flows from groundwater, which sustain rivers in the post-monsoon period. A 2018 study of 55 catchment areas shows that there has been a decline in the annual runoff of India's major river basins, such as Baitarni, Brahmani, Godavari, Krishna, Mahi, Narmada, Sabarmati, and Tapti. And this is not due to a fall in rainfall, but because of economic activities destructive of their catchment areas. The fear is that if this trend continues, most of these rivers will almost completely dry up. Kerala needs to draw the right lessons from these sobering experiences. The Madhav Gargil and Kasturi Rangan reports on the Western Ghats were both attempts to help us see some of these interconnections. My difficulty with the Gargil report, however, is that it stems from the older perspective of preserving ecology for its own sake. Even as I can connect with this approach at many levels, there is no question that without demonstrating an integral link of protecting the environment with people's livelihoods, especially the poorest people living in the Western Ghats, there is no way the movement for their ecological rejuvenation can gather steam. The Kasturi Rangan report clearly acknowledges this. However, the primary device it deploys is to water down the guard guild recommendations in geographical scope by proposing just 37% of the Western Ghats under ecologically sensitive area zones down from the 64% suggested by Gargill. But this still leaves the primary task undone, even if rightly acknowledged. My contention is that the real challenge lies 
in working out detailed plans for building livelihood options for the people of the Western Ghats in a way that would enable ecological protection as well. This would create a win-win for all the people of Kerala by ensuring water security while also protecting the livelihoods of the Western Ghat dwellers. To understand how exactly this can be done, I will provide you some striking illustrations from across the globe, which will show you how environment development win-wins can be generated. Not many people realize that the city of New York gets its water supply by paying those living in its catchment areas for the ecosystem services they provide in keeping the catchment of New York clean and green. Today, this model is being replicated all over the world, even in emerging economies like Brazil, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Ethiopia. But the most important country whose example I would like to cite here and which India and Kerala have both sought to learn from in many respects is China. You may recall that in 1998, there were devastating floods, mainly in the Yangtze River Basin, affecting millions of people and causing at least $35 billion in damages. That is what prompted the government around the turn of the century to launch the goal of converting China into an ecological civilization. This entails, number one, the need to respect, protect, and adapt to nature. Two, a commitment to resource conservation. Three, environmental restoration and protection. Four, recycling. Five, low carbon use. And six, sustainable development. One of the most useful ways of articulating the agenda for sustainable development is the Chinese concept of ecological red lines and more fundamentally, ecological space, which they rank alongside urban space and agricultural space as one of the three key spaces in need of careful management. Nationwide, more than 10 provinces have demarcated zones under the protection of the ecological red line. The Chinese have set out standards, mechanisms, and assessments aimed at improving implementation while ensuring harmonious development between humans and nature. In President Xi's words, lucid waters and lush mountains are as valuable as gold and silver. A team led by the renowned Stanford ecologist Gretchen Daly is helping the Chinese prioritize four major ecosystem services plus biodiversity. The four services are water retention or flood control, soil retention, sandstorm prevention, and carbon sequestration. Based on this, the Chinese have embarked on what Gretchen Daly describes as by far the biggest payment for ecosystem services scheme in the world. This includes high quality ecotourism consistent with securing rare and threatened biota. Areas that would give the highest return for ecosystem service provision are identified and those services are weighed by the number of people who benefit from them. Poverty alleviation and securing livelihoods are central to the entire effort. Those goals go together with securing the environment. They are never separated as the Chinese have understood that you can never think about protecting nature without at the same time thinking about how you would harmonize nature with people. The Chinese are also building a green financial system so that they can pursue green growth to ensure improvements in livelihoods, health, food security, water, and other aspects of environmental security, but also economic security. To my Marxist friends in Kerala, to help them see how ecological civilization remains an attainable goal, I would commend the 2014 work of Philip Clayton and Justin Heisenker called Organic Marxism, an alternative to capitalism and ecological catastrophe. The authors urge us to discard the 17th century view of nature articulated by Descartes and reinforced by Kant. Without freeing our minds of this objectifying and reductive understanding, we are not likely to be able to address the crisis to which 
this intellectual tradition itself has led us. My aim in providing these examples is to argue that resolving the apparent conflict between environment and development is a task that can be well by inviting scholars and practitioners like Gretchen Daly and Mariana Matsukato to Kerala to help shape this effort, while at the same time involving Panchayati Raj institutions and civil society organizations to mobilize people of each area in this huge task of ecological, social, and economic reconstruction. I'm willing to offer my own services in trying to bring this dream to a reality because other than Kashmir, I do not see any other region in India where such an ecological economic approach to development makes as much sense as it does in Kerala. Let me then turn again to the present situation in Kerala to prefer some possible solutions. We are in the middle of the monsoon. And as you all know, these days, rains in our state have become synonymous with landslides. The identity between rain and landslides has arisen because of the systematic decimation of the Western Ghats, aggravated by the steep gradient along their slopes. Reckless and largely illegal construction activity and quarrying has exponentially increased the probability of landslides, which have become a major hazard in districts like Wayanad, Korikod, Idaki, and Kotem, which lie along the Western Ghats. As much as 15% of Kerala's land area is prone to floods, and the proportion is as high as 50% in certain districts. These floods and landslides cause extensive damage to schools, houses, roads, railways, bridges, power supplies, communications networks, and other infrastructure. They wash away crops and livestock and affect the lives and livelihoods of millions of people. The Kerala post-disaster needs assessment estimates that at least 2.6% of Kerala's gross state domestic product got washed away by the 2018 floods instantly, and that they caused Kerala's growth rate to slip by around 1.2% in 2018 and 19. Does this not by itself make amply clear why Kerala needs a new model of development? Another aggravating factor which is responsible for floods in Kerala is the way dams have been constructed and operated in the region. Most of Kerala's dams are located in the Western Ghats, and there is a constant conflict between demands of power generation, which requires reservoirs to be full, and the imperatives of flood control, which can only happen if the dams are relatively empty before the deluge. In any case, most of the dams are meant for either irrigation or power, with flood control being only a secondary objective. Instead, as Secretary of Earth Sciences, Government of India himself recently suggested, poor reservoir management has made dams an aggravating factor in floods, as happened in Surat in 2006, Chennai in 2015, Bihar in 2016, and Kerala in 2019. A remarkable solution that needs to be emulated and scaled in this context is the work done on the Chalakudi River by a Kochi-based group of researchers of the Forum for Policy Dialogue on Water Conflicts in India. The 144-kilometer Chalakudi River has a catchment area of 1,704 square kilometers, comprising the Anamalai Hills, Parambikulam Plateau, and the Nelayampathi Hills of the Southern Western Ghats, characterized by high-altitude grasslands and lush evergreen and semi-evergreen forests. Six dams were constructed on the river between 1957 and 1971. These dams have completely altered the natural hydrological regime of the river. The degradation of the upper catchment area has resulted in drying up of many streams which feed the river after the monsoon. But the Forum for Policy Dialogue on Water has proposed an alternative reservoir operation management strategy and a catchment area treatment plan, which can both improve water security and reduce the destructive impact of heavy rainfall. Following extensive social mobilization by the forum and its volunteers, this plan was endorsed by all six riparian MLAs of the region and even by the then Chief Minister of Kerala. These are the kinds of innovative approaches that need to be institutionalized 
which could become an example for the whole country to follow. The increased frequency of urban flooding in recent years has much to do with our encroaching upon traditional lakes and destroying their natural channels through which excess water flows into rivers or the sea. If our backwaters silt up, if water channels and local water bodies are encroached upon, water will have to enter our homes as it has nowhere else to go. Understanding these blue-green areas as vital infrastructure would help both recharge groundwater and mitigate the destructive impact of floods. Leading cities of the world like Copenhagen, London, New Orleans, Chicago, Rotterdam, Melbourne, and New York are all acknowledging that the increasingly frequent cloud bursts of the 21st century demand a recognition that the economy is but a small element within the larger ecosystem. These cities are adopting exciting building with nature and room for the river perspectives with much greater emphasis on low cost blue green infrastructure that connects urban hydrological or blue functions with vegetation or green systems. This entails an iterative process involving all relevant stakeholders in understanding the flows of flood water, where this water can be stored, how and where it can be conveyed, and where connections to other plans for the urban environment can be established. Kerala can do well to learn from these ecological pioneers by carefully adapting learnings to our own conditions. The work that my friend Professor N.C. Narayanan and his students from IIT Bombay are already doing in Alapur, the Venice of the East is both commendable and in urgent need of support so that it can be scaled up to the entire length and breadth of Kerala. Another key urban problem is wastewater. Many urban stretches of rivers and lakes, as also groundwater, have untreated effluents and sewage dumped into them, which are poisoning sources of water and with toxic chemicals and waste. As the great water scholar from Berkeley, David Sedlak emphasizes, there is an opportunity here for us to leapfrog the outmoded high cost, high energy technologies of the mid 20th century and adopt latest eco-restorative, low cost technologies for wastewater treatment. Again, these have been successfully tried and tested at several locations across the country. The College of Military Engineering in Pune in 2003, Udaipur's Ahar River in 2010, the Buddha stream of the Satlej River in Ludhiana, and the restoration of the five stream Rasulabad Ghat complex of the Ganga at Ilabad in 2011. This is yet another example of the kind of green investments Kerala needs, which would create a large number of jobs for our unemployed, unemployed women and youth. Equal attention must also be paid to Kerala's extensive coastline, which is yet another key element of Kerala's unique ecology, economy, and society. This is especially important in this era of climate change, with Kerala being one of the most vulnerable spots on the planet in this respect. Kerala's long coastline is among the world's most densely populated regions, exceedingly vulnerable to sea level rise. That the sea starts in the mountains, is a familiar adage among many coastal communities. The state of the mountains, forests, grasslands, rivers, riverbeds, floodplains, ponds, lakes, backwaters, and groundwater is of critical significance to the coastal ecosystem and communities, particularly our fisher folk. The coastal zone is the fuzzy interface between sea and land, where fresh water meets its saline counterpart, creating an ecosystem with the highest primary productivity on the planet. Potential coastal risks include salinization of freshwater and heightened vulnerability to flooding. The coastal zone has a high groundwater table with a thin upper lens of potable freshwater. Therefore, saline intrusion into the aquifers can permanently contaminate groundwater. These impacts may be additionally compounded by land subsidence in areas where water tables are declining. Such aquifers must get special attention through a combination of measures of prevention, mitigation, and protection against saline water increase. Excessive mining of river sand creates hungry water, 
that is water without sediments and nutrients, further exacerbating the productivity loss of coastal waters. Industries along the coast make substantial demands on fresh water and also cause chemical, thermal, and nuclear pollution. This affects coastal groundwater quality, but it also ruins the productivity of coastal vegetation, such as mangroves. A starting point for a merger of landscape and coastal seascape perspectives is the concept of sediment cell. The National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management, NCSCM, defines a coastal sediment cell as the length of the coastline and associated nearshore areas where movement of sediments is largely self-contained. Each cell contains a complete cycle of sedimentation, including sources, transport paths, and sinks. The sediment budget and the sediment transport rate, which depend on coastal processes prevalent in the area, play vital roles in determining the stability of the coast. The key relationship to, to be understood is that between coastal sediment budgets and coastal management schemes. As the sediment budget and processes vary from one coastal area to the other, there is a need to demarcate coastal areas based on these properties. This is done by using the concept of the sediment cell. The NCSCM has mapped 27 primary cells, 10 in the west coast and 17 on the east coast of India, comprising a further 59 subcells. I would strongly argue for the use of the sediment cell concept as a preliminary step to plan interventions in coastal areas to minimize further damage to an already endangered coastline. Coastal infrastructure development, which tampers with the natural dynamics of such sediment cells should be minimized. Adequate sandy beaches must be left free for natural forces of wind and waves to stabilize the landscape seascape interface. Marshes, wetlands, sea grasses, and mangroves not only provide cost-effective flood and storm protection, they can also absorb up to five times more carbon per hectare than terrestrial forests. In addition to all the measures I have spoken of thus far, emphasis on green buildings, green sources of energy, green industries, etc. Through that, we could see a large number of green jobs being created for Kerala's unemployed women and youth. Here, I would emphasize building on one of Kerala's greatest strengths, the Kudum Kudumbashree program. What is remarkable about Kudumbashree is not merely the way it combines personal, social, and economic independence of women with prosperity of the family, but also how it mobilizes the strength of women's collectives, which make an impact both in their interface with the marketplace as well as ensuring accountability of government programs. It is therefore a unique experiment in deepening political, social, and economic democracy. Green livelihoods for women and youth should become the cornerstone of the new paradigm of development pioneered by Kerala, which could once again become an example for the world to follow. I will conclude my illustrations of a green development model by turning to agriculture. You would all be aware of the ongoing debate between the Kerala Agriculture Department and the State Planning Board on the move towards agroecological farming. I'm sorry to see the debate being conducted on misplaced premises, such as the Sri Lanka experience, and on some narrowly fundamentalist versions of natural farming, when the case for agroecology is truly unimpeachable. All over the world, there is an acknowledgement of the need to move agriculture away from the chemical intensive farming paradigm of the past 50 years. In the latest quadrennial review of its strategic framework and preparation for the organization's medium term plan 2018 to 2021, the FAO states, and I quote, high input resource intensive farming systems, which have caused massive deforestation, water scarcities, soil depletion, and high levels of greenhouse gas emissions cannot deliver sustainable food and agricultural production. Needed are innovative systems that protect and enhance the natural resource base while increasing productivity. Needed is a transformative process 
towards holistic approaches such as agroecology and conservation agriculture, which also build upon indigenous and traditional knowledge." Unquote. Nature-based farming is also about crop diversification in line with local agroecology. Unfortunately, since the Green Revolution, we have remained stuck to monocultures with the same crop being grown on the same land year in, year out. This has depleted our soils, but also made farmers extremely vulnerable to climate and market risks. In the light of this understanding, attempts are being made all over the world to foster an ecosystems approach with higher sustainability and resilience, lower costs of production, as also economy in water use. Why I speak of needless polarization on the issue in Kerala is that there can be no disagreement on what sustains productivity in farming. It is the fertility of the soil, which is deeply impacted by soil organic carbon and soil microorganisms. Recent research suggests that the soil teeming with fungi and bacteria is better able to break down nutrients into a form that improves their uptake by crops. Both organic carbon and microorganisms have suffered a decline in Indian soils in the decades following the Green Revolution. A progressive reduction in the use of chemicals at the appropriate pace will give the soil a chance to rejuvenate itself, thereby activating the soil food web. In a paper I wrote earlier this year in the journal Ecology, Economy and Society, I have outlined the many formidable barriers facing this transition to agroecology and the number of support systems the state needs to set up to dismantle these barriers. I would urge the government of Kerala to pay careful attention to this large agenda of transformative investments that will prove critical for the future of our farmers. Finally, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic provides an even more urgent context to the need for a paradigm shift in farming. It is now understood that there is a large list of deadly pathogens that have emerged due to the nature destroying ways in which we practice agriculture, among which are the H5N1 Asian avian influenza, H5N2 multiple swine flu variants, H1N1, H1N2, Ebola, Nipah virus, Q fever, hepatitis E, salmonella, food and mouth disease, etc. And Kerala, I know, has an experience of so many of these diseases. Therefore, I would argue that the change being advocated by the Department of Agriculture towards nature-based farming in Kerala is urgently required and indeed long overdue. As I come to the end of my lecture, there is a thought I want to leave you with. In my regular visits to Kerala, I can clearly feel the sense of frustration and directionlessness in the youth, a cynicism and despair never found during the heydays of idealism that I saw firsthand during my seven year stay in Kerala in the 1970s and 1980s. This is of course, not something entirely unexpected as the radical dreams of that time ran aground, not just in Kerala, but across the world. But I do sense that this unease among the youth also reflects a genuine stirring, a seeking for something deeper that would fill the void they feel inside. And I believe this is precisely the state of consciousness that holds within it the kernel of something truly novel and revolutionary to emerge. This revolution, however, will need to contain an element of profound inner transformation. Here, I would draw your attention to Baba Sahib Ambedkar and his relentless lifelong search for a spiritual home ground for society, which I had occasion to study in some depth when I was invited to deliver the annual convocation address at Ambedkar University, Delhi in 2018. Ambedkar's search was to find the deepest solutions for the intractable problem of suffering on earth for all beings, human and non-human, living and non-living. And for him, spirituality was not something restricted to the personal sphere. It did not allow for a crude separation of the personal and the political. To put it simply, for Ambedkar, the challenge of social transformation 
was inextricably bound to the task of inner transformation. One could not happen without the other. Ambedkar's legacy is best viewed within a pantheon of great thinker activists who brought to bear reconstructed spiritual resources to address what they saw as the key challenges of their own time and context. These include Gustavo Gutierrez, who saw the theology of liberation as I, and I quote, as a reflection born of the experience of shared efforts to abolish the current unjust situation and to build a different society, freer and more human. My purpose is to reconsider the great themes of the Christian life within this radically changed perspective, unquote. Similarly, Paulo Freire, in his path-breaking work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, could as well be seen as speaking about Kerala in the 1950s and 1960s, when land reforms were a central element of the agenda of the left and the subsequent failures of that campaign. I quote, it is not to become free that they want agrarian reform, but in order to acquire land and thus become landowners, or more precisely, bosses over other workers. Many of the oppressed who directly or indirectly participate in revolution intend, conditioned by the myths of the old order, to make it their private revolution. The shadow of their former oppressor is still cast over them. In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well." Unquote. I know many of you will find in these statements deep resonances with the recent history of Kerala. My point is simple. How can an alternative to capitalism be built without transforming individual aspirations? After all, capitalism has proved to be the most efficient economic machine to deliver goals based on human acquisitiveness, unbridled competitiveness and greed. I would go as far as to say that till fundamental human aspirations are not transformed, it will remain impossible for humanity to look beyond capitalism. I'm not making here an apology for organized religion, so much of which has been for so long in cohorts with the established structures of power. A lot of mainstream religious discourse had tended to propose an acceptance of the status quo or has been conveniently interpreted as saying so by the powers that be. This is truly ironic because the founders of these religions were all social revolutionaries of their day, advocating the overthrow of exploitative systems of oppression. The key difference is that inner transformation is central to their revolutionary project. For history has repeatedly shown that moral codes of conduct externally imposed by family, party, or church just do not work. Rather, they can prove seriously counterproductive. As Baba Sahib Ambedkar reminds us, and I quote, the Buddha's way was not to force people to do what they did not like to do, although it was good for them. His way was to alter their inner disposition so that they would do voluntarily what they would not otherwise want to do, unquote. If we can leverage these energies of inner transformation across religious traditions and combine them with a social project that places our relationship to nature and the quest for sustainable development at the core of the political, economic, and social agenda, Kerala could once again become an example for the whole world to follow. It is with this prayer that I leave you today. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shah. It is a really exhilarating talk, leaving us thinking and rethinking. I'm sure the Achyada Menon Studies and Research Center would give wide publicity to this, because this needs to be studied in detail and considered in detail by the people and more by the policy makers. That's my firm belief. And the conclusion was really uh, kind of very philosophic conclusion, which of course will take some time to sink. Uh, sink. Now, I think for some time, uh, we have some time. Anybody who has a question can either post it in the chat box or 
uh, unmute and ask. Yeah, Mr. Shemuel, you can ask. Okay, Jimmy. Okay, I want uh, to ask you how, according to you, the experience, uh, the example uh, of uh, economic and social model of uh, uh, Kerala can. Uh, support uh, development and uh, prosperity of uh, another uh, poor uh, and uh, developing uh, areas uh, around the world? Yes, uh, well, I, I couldn't fully hear your question. I think you're asking how Kerala can be an example yes. for other <coughs> countries across the world. See, I think... Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, there are many elements of the Kerala model which are exemplary and in fact can be and are already being adopted in many parts of the world. The one that I mentioned, you know, the entire example of the Kudumbashri program. Now, you know, uh, if you study the program in detail, it has a foundation in economic empowerment of women. And the leadership of women is critical, as has been shown in development studies across many, many development projects in the world, whenever women are in the lead and there is a foundation of this kind of economic empowerment, the development programs tend to succeed much better. Now, what Kudumbashri does, however, is it's extremely unique because unlike many other SAG programs in the country, and Mr. Vijayanand may correct me if I'm wrong, but the link that has been established in Kerala between the Panchayati Raj institutions, which are institutions of local democracy, and the women's economic institutions is so powerful that it has potential to transform both the political system and also the paradigm of development that I am sort of advocating in this lecture. What I am saying is that if we can build uh, this kind of model of green development uh, upon the foundation that Kodumbashri has already provided on a large scale for Kerala, then it becomes an example not only for Kerala, but for the rest of the world to follow. Because the ecological crisis that I'm describing is not unique to Kerala. It's actually inherent in the kind of development paradigm that the world has followed since the Industrial Revolution, and especially since the mid 20th century, when that paradigm was accelerated in many of the emerging newly independent uh, economies and countries of the world. There are many other elements of the Kerala model which I could elaborate upon, but I thought uh, it would become too long an answer. Uh, this is Michael Tarakan, can I? Yes, Michael, please. Please, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to Mihir for a wonderful presentation. I want to um, add something which may be of uh, use. Uh, sure to supplement your, your presentation. Uh, as a student of history, I was highly impressed by the fact that in the 1920s, um, and of course in the 1910s, Sri Narayana Guru, our major social reformer, yes. had advised the women of, uh, you know, women staying close to water bodies, like sea or backwater or river, not to feed their children in ordinary water, but water which has been warmed up and heated up so that it would be healthier. Uh, his argument was very simple, that we, whatever you throw out into the water comes back to you during the high tide. So this was uh, very uh, much discussed in several uh, branches of the Sri Narayana Dharma Paripalana Yogam. And uh, um, women, 
took the lead in adopting this advice, though it meant a high increase in their family budget because you have to heat up the water, you have to collect it. And I, I can see um, so a parallel, uh, international parallel in the Scandinavian countries where people had difficulty in washing their used plates. So they used to dip it in a basin of water and then take it out and wipe it and use it. And the parish councils were again the women intervened and argued that there should be three basins, one of ordinary water, one of heated water, and one of soap water. And this also meant higher family budget, but nevertheless, people seems to have adopted it. And this seems to be, uh, of course, a very simple example of how women in Kerala uh, long ago and adopted when a suggestion came their way. I'm, I'm only saying this for want of better things to say at a very, very, uh, a very, very impressive presentation. From no, I think Sri Narayan Guru's contribution. I mean, which you know, I would have liked to mention if there was more time. But that's that's something which has been so formative for the entire experience of Kerala in the 20th century. Absolutely. Yeah, from. Kerala Agriculture University, I saw a hand. Prema. Uh, yes. Hello, hello. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yes. I think there is an echo. If you have two, uh, this thing, yes. you can close one. Uh, just use one, <coughs> one to use this. Okay. Ah. Yeah, now it's better. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it is a very wonderful talk. And uh, you have, in the talk, you have quoted that Kudumbashri is one of the strength of Kerala model of development. Uh, but uh, some of my recent surveys indicate that uh, with uh, some rural, in some rural areas. Oh. I'm not able to hear now. Has she got cut? Yeah, I think Prema, now we are not able to hear you. In Delhi. And they also had done a study in uh, Trivandrum. And they also came across the same uh, observation. And the, it is said that they, it is, uh, they are in, uh, having good repayment and they are doing everything promptly and that is why they are being hailed. But at the same time, for repaying these loans, they are taking loans and loans again and again, which adds to a lot of loans on their credit trap on their head. That is what burden on their head. So that is some field data that I got from my survey with the students. So I think this needs to be uh, studied in detail because for everything now we are talking about Kudumbashri as a, a single point of uh, uh, solution. Okay. So that is uh, uh, yeah. my Can one I, observation I had made. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think it's a very important observation because, you know, uh, through my own experience of working with self-help groups of women, etc. This is a very major issue that needs to be very carefully addressed. That it should not become that once you're giving so many loans, that actually you're increasing the burden of indebtedness. Now, this does happen in some cases where the soundness of lending has not been adhered to. But when I spoke of Kudumbashri, I'm taking the large picture because this is one of the most studied programs also in the world. So I'm not at all discounting the uh, you know, data you have collected and I'm not doubting its authenticity. But if you take the larger picture, there are so many studies, so much research has been done on the program and the potential that it represents is what I was talking about. I think institutionally, you will find uh, very, very few programs which have a stronger, more robust structure. But of course, the kinds of problems you have pointed to need to be addressed and can be, I think, corrected if the process of lending is uh, strictly, you know, the soundness of lending is strictly adhered. Uh, Mr. Jay Shankar. Yeah. Hello, me. This is Vijay Shankar. 
Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, two pillars of uh, Kerala model. One is growth and other is redistribution or distribution in general for human development. So you spoke a lot about the growth part of it, but there was not much coming on redis uh, redistribution. Or if you talk about uh, human development, the way a health system is getting privatized in Kerala education, those kind of issues, and how relevant is a redistribution agenda uh, still in Kerala? That is my uh, broad question, because the other pillar of the Kerala model has not been sufficiently covered is what I feel. And uh, second point is uh, more that uh, there's no mention of KN Raj also in your lecture. You know, there was a lot of mention of Achyutamayan and other people, but KN Raj ka contribution to, I think I feel there was some initial thoughts, I think when, uh, uh, I don't know, when Raj was still active on how to redesign Kerala's uh, path in a more ecologically uh, oriented manner. Uh, that was probably not uh, also mentioned. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, focus on the first part of the question. Actually, I, I think you've not got it exactly right. I'm not talking of two pillars, which are growth and distribution. What I'm saying is that every growth path has distributional consequences. And what we tend to do is to look at it as a binary between, you know, what Kerala is doing, if okay, it's done well in distribution, but not in growth. What I'm saying is instead of polarizing it in this binary fashion, we should think of a growth path which will generate positive distributional consequences. But to come to your point anyway about the experience of Kerala and, you know, the human development index in Kerala, Kerala has ranked uh, number one, uh, you know, in the country for many years. But I accept, especially in education, I think the quality of education remains of concern. I have not addressed those issues because uh, I wanted to give a thrust to the new direction which Kerala needs to take. But on health, I think uh, it has done remarkably well. Uh, contrary to what you're saying, I would say the, uh, the access to public health has been growing rapidly in Kerala in the recent years. The recent initiatives towards healthcare in Kerala, I feel, are a great source of uh, uh, you know, encouragement and uh, something to look forward to. So, I mean, I'm sure others in this forum are much more uh, informed about that, but that's the impression I got by looking at the literature I saw. I don't know what Mr. Vijayanand has to say on that. Okay, thank you. No, you're, you're brought it right, you're brought it. Do you think health is doing well? I mean, that's a- I Yeah, mean, health is doing well, at least in terms of use of public facilities increasing over the last 15, 20 years, uh, not mainly for inpatients, but for outpatients. I think that percentage has gone up quite dramatically. Yeah, right? almost touching 50 now from what was around 28, 29 when people's plan was. And the national average is nowhere in comparison. So, <clears throat> I mean, to that extent, you know, you can say, of course, there's much more scope for improvement, but uh, yeah. Any other question? Hello. Yeah. Uh, this is Rahul Jain. Rahul, please. Yeah. Hi. So, um, so I, 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 I was uh, wondering on the micro plans that you, you know, when we are talking about developing micro plans for various different areas of Kerala, um, particularly how, uh, you know, generally we are always. Uh, taken, uh, you know, we are swayed away by big plans um, of how to benefit, you know, reform whole sectors and stuff. I really admire the um, admire the micro planning that is required, but at the same time, um, you know, achieving scale and you know, uh, addressing prob like you know problems of un unemployment at large and the sectoral, uh, you know, focus of your talk has been on agriculture and ecological perspective on that. But could you talk more about the other the services and the manufacturing sector and how sustainability can be made a concern there? And would that also work with micro planning better than broad, broad reforms? See, to first take up your point about micro and macro, I think actually both are required. Micro planning cannot happen without a macro perspective and a supporting, you know, in fact, I mentioned that at several points, the state has to provide that enabling environment. And for that, Kerala has historically, because, you know, we have 
the very uh, father of the you know people's plan uh, mr vijayanan uh, sitting with us and the way that was done he can tell you much better but it's not just about making micro plans but about having a macro view and bringing the micro plans together to form actually a kind of a national plan as far as you know what you're saying it's not only about agriculture and ecology actually what i'm saying is every sector has to be seen from the ecological lens so for example industry what i'm trying to say is that if you have water intensive industries in coastal areas which has been the history of this country you know you you don't look at ecology and you plan for industry you go wrong what i'm saying is through the ecological lens you get many many possibilities of setting up industry which is in line in alignment with local ecology and you know i mentioned the work of mariana matsukato that she is an you know outstanding example of she is advising european government she is advising the palestinian authority on how this thing can be done this realignment has to be done so just to give one example again about the western guards which i think should have been part of the lecture which you know uh, somehow has got left out which is the enormous resources that kerala has in terms of the non timber forest products i think it runs into thousands of crores that market now that can we have an institution like the national dairy development board did for milk you know ultimately nationally we need an institution in india and kerala could give the lead where the value chain the entire value chain is developed so that the primary uh, collectors of that produce the adivasi communities the tribal people the forest dwellers the living in the western ghats they can move up the value chain if processing value addition activities this is a huge opportunity which can both protect the western ghats see what i am saying is kerala has in a way constrained choices if you like but within that you can make multiple win wins so we have to find ways in which the ghat is uh, you know rejuvenated restored actually preserved while generating value from the resources that it contains and i think that is the way in which i am saying i am providing a framework within which we must think uh, whether it's uh, building construction whether it's urban infrastructure all of these must align of course i'm not saying you don't have other industries you know the it sector uh, you know dr thomas isaac's budget in <clears throat> the last budget he presented as finance minister had a lot of interesting proposals for building a knowledge economy i'm absolutely in favor of that all i am saying is we have to bring a green lens if you are sitting in kerala if you are sitting in kashmir without doing that you threaten the very sustainability of the development process yeah just to add on this uh, micro planning after 25 years of decentralization when it's being appraised we have gone back to the old term which is no longer used or probably understood multi level planning that is what is uh, required Thanks. any other any other question thank you so thanks a lot uh, dr mehsha it was excellent and in case you want to slightly modify uh, your lecture you are free to do it we we want to publish it and widely circulate it because this is uh, worth it it's that class yeah may i request uh, the director of costford mr chandra babu to propose the vote of thanks okay sir this uh can that be more lecture delivered by dr mirsha it's like a small revolution revolution starting from this uh, western guard and taking torrential flow of ideas and reaching the arabian sea he has given so many ideas so many innovative thinking process and we are uh, regarding green west and green economy green uh, job market and restoring finally restoring humanity uh, it's a very very good thought process and i am also the so many good questions are also come because of the, the good uh, speech he has delivered uh, i thank dr mehsha for delivering such an enlightening lecture to us uh, thank you sir then uh i thank vian sir for uh, sharing this session and i also thank dr uh, joy lemon for giving uh, welcoming all the 
participant. Now, I have to thank the erudite audience who have um, patiently heard all these things and they have asked good questions and led the discussion. Anyway, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. To conclude on a slightly humorous note, uh, he was saying it will go into Arabian Sea. Here, I think Dr. <laughs> Dr. Shah would agree dams. You will, <laughs> you will support dams in this case. <laughs> so, thank you very much. It is really exhilarating. Thanks for the participants. Thanks to the participants also. We take it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir.